So thanks, everybody, for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, my name uh, is Ryan Waller. As I was saying, technical evangelist has nothing to do with uh, hardcore religion, I promise, um, except for containers, maybe. But um, today I'm going to talk to you about specifically uh, persistence options, so storage, so things like databases, um, and what are your options in Kubernetes, and a, an open source project named Flocker that um, our company, ClusterHQ, uh, actually uh, uh, develops in, in the open source. Um, so the agenda, basically, I want to get a, on an even plane about you know, what containers are, what I mean by persistence, what you can do with it, um, and then what are volumes specifically. So volumes can mean a number of different things when talking about these different container technologies. I'll kind of talk about what it means to Docker as well as what it specifically means for Kubernetes and what a volume is in Kubernetes and what are your different options. Um, then I'm going to do a demo. I want to spend most of my time doing the demo. Um, I really like to be hands-on. Also, while I'm doing the demo, I'm also open to questions. Um, I'd love to be more interactive uh, while we're doing this. And hopefully some time for Q&A if I've managed my time right. Um, so how many people are familiar with containers? Linux containers, Docker, awesome. So I can almost skip this slide. Um, but, but again, right, process uh, isolation, uh, it's, it's kind of like a lightweight VM to the eyeball, but really shares a kernel underneath. Um, uh, enables new ar architectures, um, yada, yada, yada. I won't spend too much on that because, because I saw all the hands, which is great. Um, next, I, I really want to talk about the two things, uh, stable versus uh, stateless, right? A, a lot of the times when people start looking into containers, they come across what they hear of the 12-factor app, which typically has containers and applications that run in those containers as stateless, meaning you know, nothing's written to uh, the actual file system or disk. Things should kind of uh, remain easily scalable horizontally, right? So it shouldn't have any uh, ties to some underlying piece of infrastructure. Um, and that's great. And, and even in the 12-factor app, they have something called a backing service. And if you're not familiar with the 12-factor app, let me back up for a second. Um, it's, it's something to look into, probably something you'll come across of if you haven't already. Um, Stateful kind of goes against that status quo. And, and what I mean by stateful is running things in containers that hold on to state, hold on to data. So what I mean by that is things like databases or logs um, or secrets, right? Things that you actually want written to disk um, so that when you have a container running that type of information, it knows that it should expect that information. Now, why this is hard is because uh, Docker today, right? if you spin up a container, you write something to the file system uh, without a volume, um, and you, you, you get rid of it, your data's gone, right? unless you use a volume. Um, and we'll get into a little more about what that is um, and, and how you can use volumes. There's a number of different uh, ways to use volumes. So container volumes in general, I don't want to label them Docker container volumes, um, mainly because uh, it, there's a number of different ways, a number of different technologies out there that can take advantage of actual storage volumes, things you can write to disk. Um, I am going to use Kubernetes and Docker as my two examples uh, on the list over here. Um, and so the one I already mentioned was this ephemeral nature of the container itself. The image is ephemeral. Things don't last that long. Things you write to it are gone. Um, then you have the idea of having a, a volume mapped into a container. So this says, OK, I need some sort of space for uh, my application to write data. And when my container goes away, I don't want it to go away. Those are, if you're familiar with the dash v flag in Docker, um, this actually creates a, a, a space in, in the uh, file system specifically that's outside of the container image. So things last on the host. Also, in um, in Kubernetes, this is very similar to empty dir. Um, if you're familiar with that option for storage in, in Kubernetes, uh, I'll get a little bit more into what Kubernetes actually allows you to do with volumes uh, in case you're not familiar. Uh, then there's host file system, right? So this is if I have some directory, right, my home directory on a Linux box, and I want whatever data is inside that directory to now be present in my container, this is what I mean by host file system and host, host volumes. So you can actually use the same volume flag in Docker to do this sort of thing where you can map temp in the host file system to temp in the container. 
So that's basically sharing data. You can write to it. You can read from it. Um, and this is also what's called host path, the host path option in Kubernetes if you want uh, to map uh, a host directory into your container or into a container that runs in a pod, right? Um, now, what I want to spend most of my time talking about is shared and external storage, right? The ability to use some sort of storage subsystem, storage layer that allows you to use things like iSCSI, NFS, SIFS, um, and that sort of so that's, that sort of thing where there's a proven storage layer underneath your containers or your microservices architectures or whatever you're running above it. Uh, in Docker, uh, as of 1.9, you can use uh, Docker volume or, or the volume driver flag, uh, which allows you to basically specify a name, a human readable name of a driver on the system that lets you talk to things like uh, uh, Amazon EBS or GCE persistent disk or Dell, HP, EMC storage, those kind of things. Uh, this is a, a, a huge pluggable layer, right? Docker really wants to push this pluggable layer. And Kubernetes also has done a really good job at this, at allowing you to plug into these storage layers. Uh, I have one example, GCE persistent disk here on the bottom. But there's a number of different ones, right? So these are all, as, as far as I'm aware, the ones that exist in the documentation today. Uh, all your options. Uh, of, hey, I want some sort of data inside my container, these are your options, right? Empty dir, host path, you got GC, AWS, you have generically, you have NFS protocol, iSCSI, uh, Flocker, which I'll talk about uh, a little more in depth, uh, RBD from Ceph, ClusterFS, a number of other ones. Git repo, I think, is a really cool one uh, that I'll talk about too. So I'm going to skip empty dir and host path because I, I kind of explained those already. Um, but GCE, right, they offer a, a number of different volumes. Uh, a standard SSD, for example, um, that can be mapped into your container. So this means that your nodes running in Kubernetes have to be running on top of Google Cloud. Um, and that enables you to talk to their uh, persistent uh, disk backend and um, map those into your pods. The really cool thing about these is you can mount the, the same disk read-only across a number of different pods, which means if you're familiar with the Kubernetes scaling feature, right, it scales really well. Some of the other pluggable features um, at, at Flocker as well doesn't technically allow that yet um, unless you know, there's a, a, um, some, some other support for NFS or read-only volumes, but specific for GCE. Um, then. Amazon, this is EBS. Most people are familiar with EBS, Elastic Block Store for your pod. NFS, Git repo I talked about. Basically, if you specify this Git repo um, option, uh, it allows you to automatically kind of clone in some code um, to your pod, which if you're interested in test QA, uh, kind of a powerful small tool there. And a new one I actually just learned about is Downward API. Um, and a pretty, pretty cool idea where the idea of a volume is kind of morphed into my data might not be um, sitting somewhere or I might not be provisioned, but I'm going to talk to an API to say, give me data from this endpoint, this API endpoint, this REST API endpoint, or something like that. Now, I'm, I'm not getting into the specifics of Kubernetes. Uh, hopefully, doing the demo, I'll be able to spur up some questions. Um, but I want to dig into a little bit about what Flocker is. Um, it, it is one of the options in Kubernetes for when you want to use a volume for your application or your pod. Um, it's a data management and orchestration layer, uh, more about automation. So uh, if you're familiar with provisioning iSCSI block devices, you need to provision it. You need to specify some options for that block device. You need to um, attach it to whatever host you're running on. So if you're on EC2, you're on DigitalOcean, you're on something else, you need to attach it to that host. And um, then you need to mount it and put a file system on it. All kind of operational tasks that add up when you run things at scale. So we, we automate all of that. Um, and we give you the options to allow you to automate that at scale. Um, and we plug into a number of different things. So we don't care what you use above us. So for instance, today I'll be using Kubernetes above us. And I'll be using CoreOS. Uh, Flocker runs on CoreOS as well. Um, and underneath, we really want to be agnostic for what storage you want to use. So uh, we have a community of drivers that basically are uh, inside our ecosystem in the product. Um, 
including EMC, VMware, Dell, OpenStack, Cinder, um, et cetera. Uh, Ceph, not for a few weeks, but I put it on there in case you're interested. Uh, and there's a few links. I'll send out this presentation afterwards if you want to learn more. So what does this actually all mean? Um, I, I think this is all a lot of information. And uh, without getting into the, 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 the actual layers of what Kubernetes is and what microservices are, um, uh, it, it, it really can be confusing. So part of what I want to do is jump into the demo, right? So you can see what this looks like. See what running an application is in Kubernetes with a backend like Flocker um, and what it looks like. So it, um, I'm going to be running through a demo. It's all on GitHub. If you're interested uh, in, in following along, please do so. Um, but I'm going to use specifically the stack from left to right is Kubernetes for the scheduling, the orchestration pieces, the networking layers. Uh, that is running on top of CoreOS. So I'm using a tool called Kube AWS um, to run K Kubernetes on CoreOS on Amazon EC2. Then I have my data layer, which is Flocker, installed as on the same nodes as my Kubernetes nodes. So it's running on the same EC2 instances. And then I'm using the Amazon EBS block store in the background to give you my storage. Um, and that's kind of the stack the, that, I, that I picked and I chose for this demo. It's obviously not something you can pick your own uh, uh, piecemeal of, of microservices layers if you really want to. Um, but these are the ones I chose. The application that I'm actually going to run is Redis. So um, one of the main use cases for running persistence inside of your pods or your containers is Hey, can I do something like run a database in a container? So Postgres, MySQL, um, Redis. And what does that actually mean? Right? What does it mean to have persistence in my container? Right, so this means that when you run a container, you're saying, I want my data that I'm writing to this database to be safe, to be around when my host fails, to be around when my container fails or moves. Right? I don't want to have to manage operationally how that data gets where it's supposed to be. I don't want to run commands to get it to somewhere else. Uh, so using Flocker allows you to think of the container and its storage as kind of a, a one atomic piece um, so that when the container moves around, so does the storage. There's a few things you have to think about right, when using an application like Redis or other, other, Postgre or other uh, databases in a container. Right? How, what does it mean to actually write state to a container? What directory does this database write to? Um, in, in Redis, there's partial versus full uh, resynchronization, which has an effect. I won't get into it, but these are um, kind of natural questions you ask when you, you know, create a service, a small service, or something you put in a container. So architecturally, this is my one slide that kind of gets into architecture. Um, what you'll see is I have a Kubernetes master, which actually has my Flocker uh, control service on it. What that actually is is basically a REST endpoint for Flocker. Flocker runs across every node in your cluster just like uh, Kubernetes does. And this is your control point, same as the Kubernetes master. Um, and on each node, I have, uh, well, Docker is already on CoreOS, right? Kubernetes talks to Docker. And I have Flocker uh, underneath it, and it's uh, attaching EBS volumes. So what you'll actually see is we'll make some pods that'll map in some EBS volumes. Then we'll go ahead and say, what happens on a failure, or what happens when I want to move my container, right? When I schedule a migration because I'm upgrading a server because it needs more RAM, or my application is, you know, uh, uh, killing the memory on this other machine, or that sort of thing. So I was going to get into actually how having to install this. Can everybody see that OK, by the way? And can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. All right, yeah. good. I should have asked that in the beginning, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so I was going to get into installing it. The, the repo I showed you before um, actually does have how to install this exact example. Um, you do need an Amazon account. Other than that, um, you, you can use free tier uh, with this. Uh, that's kind of the one caveat to this. Um, but what you're actually seeing here is four different Kubernetes nodes. So these are my Kubernetes workers, uh, my agents. And what they look like in Amazon is this. You have 
uh, the one at the bottom named AWS, uh, sorry, yeah, Cube AWS controller and the rest are workers. Um, so this, that's my control point. These are my workers. These are the ones you're seeing. Um, and we also have Flocker installed over, over all these same nodes. And if I do uh, list nodes, which is a, a Flocker CLI, get that out of there, um, you'll see the same uh, nodes. So this is saying that we have clustered services running together, both Kubernetes and Flocker. Now, what I, what I really want to do is run my Redis database. Now, I just don't want to run my Redis database as a single node, right? Not a lot of people run it that way. Um, you can, you know, there's a number of different ways you can use, like Sentinels or um, master-slave setup. In this case, um, inside this, oops. Dun, dun, dun. What are you doing? I don't even know that unicorn. Where did that guy come from? So there's no server currently available to service. Is that a GitHub problem, maybe? Already GitHub, thank you. No, good thing I have it all uh, chilling right here. <laughs> um, hopefully we'll be able to see this pretty good. Um, <laughs> Um, so uh, this is what's in the GitHub uh, repo. Uh, but there's basically a readme, and then there's YAML files. These YAML files are Kubernetes specifications. So let me just open one up, because it'll allow us to kind of talk a little bit more about it. Now, uh, who has deployed an app on top of Kubernetes before using a specification? OK, awesome. So we'll spend a little more time on this. When you want to deploy an app on Kubernetes, you write something like this, or you have something as a template. Right? Typically, applications already exist, so you have some kind of operation that says, go deploy this template, uh, go deploy this app. There's already a template for you. You're not going to have to write this thing every time. Right? That's not the idea. Um, but this is kind of infrastructure as code in a way. Um, and there's a number of different uh, options in here, such as you know, some metadata, some labels you're seeing at the top. Um, how many of these things you're going to make. So that's underneath spec, you see replica here. So this is saying, I want to deploy a Redis node. D give me one. Um, and a Kubernetes allows you to scale these things. Um, and as I go down, um, more familiarly, you see an image, which is a, it's a Docker image. So this image exists on a, a Docker Hub. Right? So it's just out there. Kubernetes knows how to talk to Docker Hub, pull that image down. Um, and use it. Then you see some commands, right? If you're familiar with Docker, these are the same commands you would give and pass to a Docker run command. So a Docker run image, and you have some command afterwards. I'm actually telling Redis server in this case to append only yes, which is actually saying write my data to a file that isn't the, um, the normal way of doing things. This actually shows us that we're writing file to disk. It doesn't have to. It could be in memory. Um, so in this case, we wanted to do it. Now, the important part down here uh, is where volumes come into play, right? And so what I'm, what's first being specified is the volume mount. So this is saying, OK, I need just a generic name. You can name it whatever you want. I'm naming it Redis Master Data, because it's the data inside my Redis Master. And uh, the mount path, which is specific to uh, what your container image is actually configured to do. So it's configured to say, put my data here. So you want to be able to make sure that data is safe um, and mount your volume onto this, onto this directory. Now, down below, there's another um, separate volumes directive that has the same name, Redis Master Data. So these have to match. This name says, OK, this is what my volume actually is. And in this case, my volume is a Flocker volume. Um, it'll be an EBS volume because that's what Flocker is config for. You can configure Flocker with whatever you want underneath and still use it this way. And then uh, we have a name of, a, of a, a, a volume inside Flocker. This could be a different name. could be the same name. Depends on how you create them. 
one thing in Kubernetes, uh, in Flocker and Kubernetes, and most of the Kubernetes uh, integrations with storage, is that volumes have to pre-exist. Um, so the first thing we have to do is create a volume. So I created a test volume first. Um, what you're seeing is the CLI command. Um, basically, you're giving it a name. So what we want to do is name it. Uh, here it is. Let's go back to this. Uh, Flocker, not there. Um, we want to name it Re Flocker Redis Master. All right, so we're going to go ahead and create this volume. Um, it's going to be 10 gigabytes in size. And we're going to give it, uh, the dash n is actually a node. So I have a bunch of nodes up here. And we're just designating it to say, attach it to this node for now. Kubernetes might tell you to move it later. Uh, and so what actually happens is you instruct um, Flocker to go out and um, create this um, volume. And so as you see, it's saying it's detached right now. Right? We told it to attach to somewhere. But what's happening right now is it's going out to EBS saying, I want a 10 gigabyte, uh, gigabyte um, EBS volume. And I also want you to attach it to this 228 node. So what you're seeing is the kind of in-flight, I'm working on attaching it. Now it's attached. Um, great. So we have a volume out there somewhere. It's now has an Etsy 4 file system on it. It's ready to go. has no data in it. Um, cool. But what do we really want to do with it? We want to use it in this specification, this, um, this Kubernetes specification. So I can't go to this one again. I'm going to have to go back to my readme. Let's see, if it's, let's see if it's up again. Nope. Thank you, GitHub. Thank you. Can I yeah, sure, please. Questions? Correct. Correct. Right. So that's just talking to uh, EBS and saying, I want a volume somewhere out there. And if, you went in, if I went in my console, I could see that volume just sitting there, ready to go. Uh, no containers involved at that point. Um, so the next portion is we actually want to create uh, this. Um, we want to create this application. So uh, I forget where exactly it exists. So we're going to have to now, there it is. So we want our examples. There we go, Redis KS and Redis controller. So what we're, instruct we're, we're instructing to Kubernetes to do here is create, and then we pass it that YAML file. So um, what we specified is create a Redis master and mount that volume. So now what we want to do is we want to look and see, OK, well, what's happening in Kubernetes? Let me refresh here. What this is saying is, hey, Kubernetes, what's the status of that application I wanted you to go run? Uh, right now, it's saying it's not ready uh, because uh, the image is downloading. So this is saying that you, you told me an image to use, which is your Redis image. Uh, I don't have it yet. So let me go out and fetch it, right? Um, which, you know, depending on how Docker is cooperating, can take um, a little bit of time or a lot of time if your image is large or if it's not too large, um, it'll take more or less time. What you can do in the meantime is you can also run the, com the command uh, describe pod and give it the, the pod name. And you get a whole bunch of state about what it actually is running. And you'll see the name, you'll see the image being used, you'll see the, the, uh, the node in which it's being deployed on. Now, if you notice, our, our, um, our volume was attached to 10, 10, 10, 0, 0, 228, right? But our application is being deployed to 10, 0, 0, 227. So uh, I've now instructed a uh, container to go bring up on a on a node where my volume doesn't exist. Oh, crap, right? Um, that's not good. But what's actually happening in the background is Flocker should have reacted and moved that volume. So as you can see, it's now reporting that, hey, it's OK. Uh, your pod was coming up on a different node, so I noticed you wanted to use it, so I put it over there for you, which is really handy. Um, and our pod, oops, 
our pod is now um, probably running, which is great. Right? Um, this is our Redis container up and running. Um, and what we can do now is look at what exactly happened in our pod. So we can take this command, uh, not this command, we want this command. Um, and we can say, uh, hey, you know, this is the logs command saying, I want to know what's happening inside my container. So did Redis successfully start up? Kubernetes is saying it did, but I, you know, I want proof myself uh, because I don't trust Kubernetes for uh, whatever reason you may have. And we can see that our, our uh, logs are reporting uh, Redis started up, no problem, uh, which is great, right? So this is what we expected. And um, it's kind of underneath. You're not seeing that you're actually writing something to disk, right? You're, it, this is kind of uh, Flocker and the storage underneath. You're using EBS volume, but it's, it's invisible to the user. So now we want to put some data in my container. It's going, using VI to go through this readme file is less enjoyable than using GitHub, for sure. <laughs> um, so now we can go into our container as we did before. And we need the whole exec command. There we go. So this exec command that you're instructing uh, Kubernetes to do is basically saying, if you're familiar with Docker exec, what it's saying is, hey, I want you to go into my container um, and run some command. So in this case, I'm saying, put me in the container um, because I want to run some commands in it. And we didn't run the Docker, the master. We run the master. So now, at this point, we're in our container. right? If we do a df-h, we can see our, uh, our volume exists. right? So it's our 10 gigabytes. It's slightly skewed. Um, and it's an actual disk that's on the host, um, and it's owned by varlib Redis, right? So this is saying that, okay, you've successfully given me storage for my Redis database to write to. Um, and uh, this, is, this is great. This is all good news. <laughs> um, Kubernetes gives you some internal endpoints for networking, so we need to make note of uh, this is my... Um, that this is my IP address in here. Um, so we can talk to the Redis CLI and push some data into it. So what I'm going to do is now, inside the container, um, run a Redis command, um, which is basically just adding a list. Right? Uh, we can say a beer. Oop. And and beer and pizza, because that's what <coughs> we're enjoying tonight. Um, now we want to make sure, OK, so we added some data. Um, does it exist? And um, oops. Does it exist in our database as we thought it did? We don't want our push. We want a. Oh, that is some UI thing. L range. Anyway, no way it's giving me weird weirdness, but we want to be able to uh, list our database. It looks like my UI is hating me. There we go. So this is just basically saying, okay, how how. What's the data inside my Redis database at this very moment, um, which we created some wonky list because I screwed up some CLI commands. Um, we can exit out of our container because we were just inside of it. Um, and uh, now we actually know that our Redis uh, uh, database has uh, some data in it. So now what I want to do is uh, add a Redis slave. Right? We want to say, OK, I want to configure um, some replication to this, right? Because what we've actually done is add some sort of uh, storage that's now keeping this data in inside of it, um, and now we want to deploy uh, some more uh, 
some more applications. So what we first have to do is create a service for the Redis master. So what a service is in Kubernetes is basically it creates an endpoint, a way to access um, your, um, your, your applications or pods running in your container. And we can see which services exist by running the get service command. So we can see that we have a Redis master. Uh, it's uh, it labels we had in the spec before. App role is master. Um, now we want to also create our slaves. So we had the same um, the same YAML file as we did before, but there's a slight uh, there's a slight difference, right? Yep, no problem. I have to actually create the volume first anyway, so. Getting close to time anyway, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, so it's the very similar thing, but it has this different name, like Redis Slave. Um, it has a different image because it's specific to running the slave node of uh, Redis cluster. Um, and it also has the same uh, Flocker data sets, but in this case, we've now created a different data set. We, uh, we need a different data set called uh, Redis Slave. Um, so uh, like I said, in Kubernetes, you, these have to exist beforehand. So we just want to name it uh, Redis Slave. We want to make sure and go ahead and create it before we create our specification. Um, that's the only difference, uh, really, is just the naming of the, the volume you want to use and whatever differences you have, like your image name and, and so forth. Um, then we go ahead and create our, our other pod and, um, and our service for that. So now we should have um, two services, one for our master, one for our slave. We should have two pods, uh, one master and one slave. So um, the slave is doing the same thing. It's downloading the image. Uh, it's installing. Um, um, the same app, Redis, and it's mounting in the, the data. And what you'll actually see is we'll, we'll go ahead and look at the same kind of logs that we did before. Um, but in this case, we are looking at our uh, Redis slave, and we have a different pod. Um, and we should see that it's, it's being replicated, right? So we want to say, OK, um, this is our logs from our Redis slave. And what you're seeing is that, OK, I've found my master. So these are two containers inside of Kubernetes talking to each other. This is saying, OK, my slave came up, found my master. I need all your data uh, because um, I want the same data uh, to be replicated to me as a slave. And I also have my own EBS volume, right? So if we look at our EBS volumes, um, we can see that there's now two for our Redis master and our Redis slave. Um, and you saw the movement from one node to the other. So in, in lieu of time, I'm not going to show the, um, the actual failover piece of it. But because you saw the movement earlier, if I kill that pod, if I kill the pod or kill the host the pod is running on, um, which actually might be easier. So um, I'll just do that, because why not? Um, this Redis slave is running at 10.10, 10, 2.28. Uh, if we find we find our 228 node, which is one of these, we can go ahead and say, okay, go ahead and oops, like you know, it terminated, it failed for whatever reason. Um, and in this case, I'm telling EBS, uh, sorry, EC2 to terminate my node, right? Um, so wait, I put data in there, right? Is my data safe? Um, and what's going to happen to my pod, right? So. This is that high availability piece to it, is that you have a master slave. Your storage is now um, on both of them. The data is safe in them. Uh, but now we have to uh, go ahead and see, OK, what is Kubernetes doing with it? Um, it? OK, it still says it's running. Now let's see where it's running. It's probably just not trying to re do we, uh, Maybe it's already back up. Oh, OK, there we go. So as you can see, we. Kubernetes has said, OK, your, your host died. So your original slave, uh, it, it's, I'm terminating it, or I'm telling it to terminate because it's gone. right? It failed. Um, but I'm, it's OK. I'm bringing up another one. Um, and what's actually happening 
um, in the background is that because Kubernetes is failing over your, your pod, um, uh, Flocker also reacts and is moving uh, data sets around. So as you can see, I had two volumes attached to that node. Um, one was just a test volume, but now it's saying, okay, where should I put them, right? I'm reacting to the, your node failing. Um, and Kubernetes will uh, react by uh, telling it where to attach it. So now it's reattached at 226 and um, is not running yet because the image is, is still downloading. But um, I think we're almost at time, so I want to stop. Uh, do I have a few minutes for questions? Cool. So I know it was a lot, a live demo, but and I didn't get too many questions in. So maybe it was too much demo for not enough time. <laughs> But uh, please, any questions at all? Sure. Flocker is now copying over to the volume? No, actually, in this case, it's the same volume. So because you provision that volume first, um, all Flocker is doing is saying um, it was attached to a Kubernetes node, which is an EC2 node. Now we're saying your pod has failed, your host has failed. So Flocker says, OK, there's a failure. Kubernetes is instructing me to move my pod. So Flocker just does the reattachment. So it's just, your data hasn't moved. There's no data layer interference. right? We're not moving bits around. We're just moving that attachment and that mount point. It's the same mount point on uh, your new, new node as it was. That's why you know, Kubernetes can basically reattach your pod. So when you ask for some stories, does it reserve the amount of stories or can you <coughs> Right, so it's, it's not a reservation in the way that Kubernetes does reservations. Um, when, you ask it, when you ask Flocker to provision that storage, it's actually provisioning 10 gigabytes. Right? But if you don't use it, right, that pool is sitting there. You're not racking up IOPS. Um, and it depends. Right? If you're using Flocker with different backends, it, it's, it reacts differently, costs differently. But um, it's, it doesn't actually come up if you look at the reservations. Is there a higher bound? Like if I reserve 10 gigs and I start using 12 gigs, yeah, so w what we typically do is um, we can, you can size your volume fairly large. Um, and we do have, a, so our, our drivers do support resizing only up, um, but that's not built into Kubernetes. So you can like, tell Kubernetes to say automatically make my volume bigger, more space. Um, so again, if you had a backend that does thin provisioning like EMC scale IO, Right, that would essentially have the same idea, and you could still use whatever backend to scale it up bigger as well. In your, in your um, where is Slate? How did it find its masters and find the on the network? That yeah, yeah, great question. Actually, um, in the YAML file, what, uh, what actually is happening is that there's two ways Kubernetes has to um, find. Um, some sort of network. So, well, there's two ways that I'm using, which is either through environment variables, which happen when you create a Kubernetes service. So when you say create a service, uh, Kubernetes knows to say, I want to populate environment variables for the services that are available in this namespace. So when I bring up that cluster, you automatically have something named Redis master host, which gives you the IP. Um, and that's based on the name that you give your uh, pod, your container in the pod. So because I'm running a Redis master. So all the slave does is I want to know if my master is running. Is it there? It looks for the environment variable. Uh, then it calls that IP address. The, the Git repo um, has those examples. So if you look inside here, uh, there's a Redis slave. And you can look at the run. And this is an entry point script for the Redis slave. And you can see this is. This is actually the environment variable that it's assuming Kubernetes has populated. Does uh, Flocker have any uh, responsibilities for uh, a live running container, or is there only a provision? Um, <clears throat> so there, there, we, we try to ma remain kind of agnostic to the container technology, the orchestration framework technology. But because we know what containers are using what volumes, that's how we know if container moves. Um, that we know, OK, my container mapping is gone, so let me go ahead and move it. Um, it doesn't, it, it touches a little bit today, 
Uh, you won't notice it. It's just that mapping. But in the future, it won't at all. So we'll do mappings through orchestration frameworks. So we'll know how to integrate better, more seamless, whatever you want to call it. Um, so you had all your nodes on EC2, right? Yeah. Can you mix and match and have four nodes on four sources? Uh, say like DigitalOcean EC2? Yeah. yeah. Um, not today. So uh, in, we do have a roadmap in Flocker to be more involved in the data layer. So say if you wanted to um, run your, uh, one of your services in EC2 and then migrate it to Azure or DigitalOcean, right? you need some sort of replication or data layer to do something. Right? We don't do that today. But there's no reason you couldn't have two Flocker clusters uh, doing different data things. Um, or uh, typically in microservices, you'll have your stateless services. You can put them wherever you want, but have your stateful services in, a, in a, some sort of uh, cloud with stores that you trust, those kind of things. So if you want yeah, go ahead. So you want to do replication you have to do in the application space or at the storage side? Yeah, you have to do it uh, closer to the application, right? There's, um, we want to be able to do it. Be, you know, we want to still say use whatever storage you want, but if you want this feature to be able to move either private, public, 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 then you need some involvement there. Uh, what are the benefits of um, <clears throat> using this over like RDS? Sure. Um, so RDS, right? You get a database off the bat, right? Uh, you get no say in what storage you use. Um, with Flocker, you can have uh, quality of service, so you can specify quality of service. You also get kind of this pluggable infrastructure where, if you're using this in your development, test, QA, production, it's the same. Uh, it's the same environment, right? So you don't you don't have RDS on your laptop, <laughs> um, or you 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 don't have this kind of smooth transition across boundaries. And and there's a benefit there but also kind of the pluggable approach. You can kind of use whatever you want between those as well. Cool. I think that was the last one. So thank you very much. <laughs>